what's the theme there? The theme there is that for him, for his worldview, it has to be the case that grassroots working class movement, as exemplified by Jeremy Corbyn, can basically do no wrong. And if they don't win general elections, then it's because of lies, media manipulation, false class consciousness or something like that. Right. I mean, this is the same sort of rhetoric that's used by Trump supporters and people all over the political spectrum. Right. In uh, the United Kingdom, a major TV news presenter has been socially ostracized because, what, he was uh, paying off and having sexual relationships with the young men who worked for him. Let's see what Douglas Murray has to say. clogged up by these sorts of, you know, cake gate, speed gate, everything's a damn gate, you know, and everyone thinks it's so original when they put gate after anything. Um, and, uh, you know, what would the government be concentrating on? What, what might it be achieving? Um, if the answer is not much more, then there's even more trouble that we're in than I thought. Uh, but, my, but my belief is, is that we, we just are horribly misdirecting our, our energies. And yes, uh, there's, there's doubtless scandals going on. There always are. Um, and there are scandals that are of significance. I mean, you just mentioned Northern Ireland. The state knife controversy has come back up again. I don't think that outside of Northern Ireland... One in a thousand households know anything about that. Maybe they don't need to. But it would probably be a more intelligent scandal to look at than the Gordon the Gophers former sofa mate scandal. Um, I, I, I think that, but as I say, the, the main thing isn't, isn't, you know, where are the scandals? It's a very post-Watergate thing that, that, that journalists think that their job is to find all the scandals that exist, expose them, and then win all of the awards. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very sort of post-Watergate way of doing journalism. Sometimes there are scandals, then they should be exposed. But the, the whole of politics, the whole of the country isn't just a set of scandals waiting to be uncovered. Right. The, the biggest problems we face are not scandals. The biggest problems we face are the results of laws and directions given by elites, such as to not you know, have police do their jobs, such as to pull people over for reckless driving and for not punishing violent criminals. Right. This has all been done with the full consent of the law. There is some fundamental failure of the media in this, but the fundamental failure of the media is a fundamental failure of government. It's a reflection of that, which is the, the fact that government seems not to be able to do in Britain any of the things that we need it to do. Have, uh, there is some fundamental failure of the media in this. But okay. That we, we are risking throwing Philip Schofield under the bus. Now, I do think what he did was wrong. He knows what he did was wrong. He was clearly in a position of power. Uh, he, and I, I think the biggest issue is the, his connections in getting this young one at his job at ITV, because it was clearly that's what got him to that position. So we, we know this was a young person who was enamored by Philip Schofield, and that power dynamic was very toxic. However, we have to remember that, you know, at some point there's going to be a situation of, you know, vultures circling the prey here. Mm -hmm. He has come out, he has said he, he, he was wrong and he lied and all of that. I think we have to remember that he's still a human being and yeah. it's this kind of bullying that took took out Caroline Flack. Now, he, he his mental health must be under enormous amounts of strain because while he was wrong, you know, he's lost so much. He's lost, you know, the, his, the credibility that he's built over a 30 year career. He's no longer hosting that award show, which named Escape Me. He's been dropped by Sober the Princess Wars. Trust. Mm -hmm. Exactly, the Princess Trust mm -hmm. he's been dropped by. Yeah. You know, and, and the runner has, has also, you know, mm -hmm. borne the brunt of this. He's had mm -hmm. his privacy invaded in so many different ways. I think enough is enough. This public inquiry is not necessary. This is not the BBC. And I think it's highlighted what happens when you have inappropriate like, mm. sort of it, relationships it, 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 at work. Okay, here's a philosopher who's accused of uh, inappropriate relationships at work. She left her husband for a student. So there's this idea now that's quite popular that if there's, if there's any disparity in status or any disparity in hierarchy, then somebody starting a love relationship with somebody who's lower than them on a status hierarchy is inherently exploitative, right? That there's something immoral about, uh, you know, it, and I've seen this even like, no matter how long that relationship lasts, no matter how much people are happy together, no matter how somebody would in hindsight say, I didn't see anything exploitative about this meeting. Uh, and because you're a woman, it's complicated because people don't usually see the woman in the higher status position. And that was something that I saw all over the place. I'm just curious if you think that that's contentless or if it's worth responding to. Um, so I think it is more specific than high-low status. Um, I think if I had um, gotten together with someone who was lower status than a tenured professor, which is a lot of people, um, people wouldn't have been so upset about it. Um, I think. So this is Agnes Callard. She's an academic philosopher. In 2011, she divorced her husband, fellow at University of Chicago professor Ben Callard. She began seeing Arnold Brooks, who was a graduate student at the time. After a year of dating, they married. She has two children with her first husband, Ben Callard, one with Arnold Brooks, and she lives with both her current husband and her ex-husband. 
and uh, she was diagnosed with autism in her 30s. And her longest book is called Aspiration, The Agency of Becoming. I think it's specifically that the person was a student and that they were a student in my own class. So it's, I, I do think it's, it's not just status, but it's power, right? Um, and so there's the idea that I was in a position of power over him and that you shouldn't have romantic relationships that, um, in that kind of context. And um, as a general rule, I think that's probably a good rule of thumb. Um, but, uh, you know, as I like explained on Twitter, um, there, because this is a somewhat fraught situation, the university has a whole bunch of regulations for how to do it. And I followed all those rules, um, including not starting a relationship with him while he was my student. Um, uh, that is, he was officially like, you know, his work was uh, transferred over to somebody else, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and, you know, I think that if we're thinking about this in a broader perspective of like, what do we want to encourage as a culture? I guess I think if everybody did what I did when they were in romantic relationships with students, namely announce the relationship to uh, officials at the university immediately, um, get out of the supervisory role, create a track record such that where I had where I had to do this over and over again, it would be very well known because they'd all be announced. I think we wouldn't really have any problems with faculty student relationships. <laughs> so okay. um, I think that um, that is all of the problem cases, and I know of many of them, are kept secret. There are people who don't uh, talk about it. And so they can't be monitored or regulated, and the abuses are unknown because they're secret. Okay, so this is Agnes Kala talking with Diana Fleischman, who's in a polyamorous relationship with, uh, who's that Jeffrey guy, psychologist? Diana Fleischman's a psychologist. Jeffrey Miller, I believe. Yeah, I think that most of the time somebody in a position of power is a man, and uh, you know, most of the time they're heterosexual relationships with men in a position of power and women in a position of less power or a you know, subservient kind of role. And um, you know, this, we don't have to... Uh, talk about evolutionary psychology that much. I do have a question about that at some point, because uh, I know that you talk to Robin a lot. Um, but in some sense, uh, it's unusual for somebody in a position of power to want to be in a serious relationship with somebody um, in a position of less power than they are, rather than somebody, usually people in positions of power. I mean, one of the whole reasons that people are motivated to attain power is to have multiple relationships, not to have singular, serious romantic relationships, right? And so that's that's what you're saying is the problem comes from. Right. Um, um, I, I also, I should say that, you know, as reported in the piece, this was very much not private. Like it, it, it was not in the New Yorker originally, but you know, it was uh, something I announced to the university and I even gave a talk about it uh, to the university community. Um, and th there wasn't much outrage. Um, and uh, it, was, it was well known within philosophical circles because of course gossip spread. Yeah. And many of the people who were very, very outraged by it on Twitter 11 years later were not outraged by it at the time when it occurred, which is like puzzling phenomenon, right? Why didn't you object to this back when, you know, he actually like was, had just been my student or whatever, rather than like 10 years later when we're married and he is a faculty member. And I think, uh, so this is part of why I didn't take the reaction that seriously is that um, those people had like 10 years to come to me and object and say, hey, I think there's a problem here. Mm -hmm. um, and but they didn't until this piece came out. And I think it's just it's the Rorschach test effect again. It's like the piece they found confronting, sort of upsetting, more personal than they wanted it to be. And they're looking like, where in this can we find something, you know, to make a moral objection to? And they fasten on something. But that very thing is not something that actually upset them when it showed up in their lives sort of uh, approximately. OK, that's uh, from Aporia magazine. Like a lot of interesting material on Aporia Magazine. They also have a YouTube channel. They interviewed Steve Saylor about a week ago. All right, back to this David Brooks piece in The Atlantic. America was awash in morally formative institutions. Its founding fathers had a low view of human nature. Yeah, all political movements on the right have a skeptical view of human nature. They designed the Constitution to mitigate it. So if such flawed, self-centered creatures were going to govern themselves and be decent with one another, they were going to need some training. So for roughly 150 years after the founding, Americans were obsessed with moral education. So major difference here between the left and the right is in their view of human nature. Or right-wing politics begins with a negative perspective on human nature. The left takes a much more positive view. David Brooks makes some good points in this article, including these two paragraphs. These various approaches to moral formation shared two premises. The first was that training the heart and body is more important than training the reasoning brain. Yeah, you're only going to have substantial moral change if it takes place within relationships, within a community. Right? Some moral skills can be taught the way academic subjects are imparted through books and lectures, but we learn most of the virtues through the repetition of many small habits and practices or within a coherent moral culture, a community of common values or a tribe. And uh, concepts like justice and right and wrong are not matters of personal taste. An objective moral order exists and human beings are creatures who are habitually seen against that order. So this is a traditional right-wing perspective that there is an objective moral order outside of oneself. This is not a left-wing perspective. 
So David Brooks says, emphasizing moral formation means focusing on an important question. What is life for? And teaching people how to bear up under difficulties. So what you need here is a hero system. And it's a hero system that teaches people what life is really all about. It's a symbolic action system, right? You learn it from your synagogue, your church, your community, your family, your extended family, right? What acts are heroic and which are villainous? Right? You get a structure of statuses and roles, right? All communities are hierarchical. You get customs and rules of behavior, all designed to serve as a vehicle for heroism in this world. So each script is unique. Each culture has a different hero system. But each cultural system cuts out roles for earthly heroics. Right? So it doesn't matter if your cultural hero system is based in belief in God, belief in the transcendent powers of your people doesn't matter if it's secular religious primitive scientific civilized right it's still a mythical hero system that people will serve to earn a feeling of value that they are special that they are ultimately useful to the universe and a system of unshakable meaning and people earn this feeling by carving out a place in nature within their community by building edifices that reflect their values, a temple, a cathedral, a totem pole, a skyscraper, a family that lasts for many generations. So man tries to create something of lasting worth and meaning that will outlive and outshine death and decay. And that's what gives people a feeling that they count. So imagine a person who extends beyond himself, right? That uh, the, the people are kind of like an amoeba, that they push their pseudopods out to a wife, to a car, a flag, a crushed flower, and a secret book, right? You get this huge invisible amoeba that spreads out over the landscape with boundaries far from its own center. And if you tear and burn the flag, or if you find and destroy some sacred flower in a book, and the amoeba screams with soul searing pain, right? We extend these pseudopods of ourselves to things that we hold dear right? To your house, right? People often get vitally upset by a piece of wallpaper that bulges, by a shelf that doesn't join, a light fixture that isn't right. Often people will break into violent arguments or crying over a panel that doesn't match. Interior decorators will reveal that many people have nervous breakdowns when they are redecorating. You can see a grown and silver templed Italian crying in the street in his mother's arms over a small dent in the bumper of his Ferrari. Right? Because we extend meaning and purpose outside of ourselves. Right? It's not just a scratch on a Ferrari. Right? People feel it as something that's very dear and dear to themselves. Right, here's Aaron McLock, English literature professor, talking about 400 years of quarantine, talking in particular about... Uh, a review of a book called Florence Under Siege, Surviving Plague in an Early Modern City, talking about the city of Florence in January 1631, responding to a plague outbreak. And this conversation took place in 2020 during the initial COVID lockdown. Looking after people and hoping they'd recover. They did have, they did use medicines, um, like sort of different uh, concoctions, theria concoctions and cordials and things like that. And there was actually a great confidence in Florence that medicine worked and that doctors knew what they were doing. And that wasn't always true in other cities. So in Venice and Milan, there was a great um, suspicion about kind of charlatans and fake doctors. Um, but in Florence, there seems to have been a kind of great confidence in, in public health. Which must have helped with the enforcing the quarantine as well that if, if people if the people trust the the, the sunny thad then they're more likely to to do what they ask yeah. and do we know why that is why the florentines were more of authority or is it or of doctors or it's just it's really i mean it's really hard to know i mean um you know in, in milan in the same epidemic there were absolutely rampant rumors about what they called the untori, these kind of um, mysterious anointers who uh, were said to kind of go around churches and swirl infection into the stoops that contained holy water, or they'd smear infection onto doorways and church pews. And um, 
those, you know, became kind of part of this really like classic understanding of what the plague was like in the 17th century. But there was really very little of that in Florence. There was one doctor um, who is said to be either Neapolitan or Sicilian, so sort of suspiciously. <laughs> suspic- okay, so Diane Fleischman is in a relationship, or no, married to Jeffrey Miller, a psychology professor who's into polyamory. His uh, website is Primal Poly. P-O-L-Y.com. And here's his wife, evolutionary psychologist Diana S. Fleischman. Just like foreign, <laughs> um, <laughs> who, who was um, accused of poisoning, um, poisoning his patients with rotten chickens and things like that. But that seems to really have been the only, the only case of that. Okay. Um, but were any, was that, were any, I mean, one of the things that we've seen in some of the more unfortunate responses to COVID-19 from the Trump administration, but also from the people in, in the street, that there's racist ideas that it's somehow that it's a foreign, it's a foreign disease that it's come from China. And that was, was there, I mean, you've mentioned the prejudice against Neapolitans and Sicilians, but were there, was there any other prejudice against groups who were, who were suspected of having brought it into the city or were they more, more rational about that? I think there are there are lots of prejudices. Um, one that is actually continuous with um, the Black Death, the 14th century plague, is um, a suspicion and prejudice against Jews. Um, they were some of the first to be kind of fully locked up um, and quarantined. They thought that perhaps um, their their black hat sort of festered putrefaction, festered contagion. Um, and that, that was a kind of very common response in Italy at the time. So I love this discussion in that they just take it for granted that there's no reason ever to be concerned or fearful about outsiders and the idea that uh, strangers out group members might introduce a plague is just unacceptable. To, to, to be suspicious of Jews. Another um, population who were marginalized were uh, prostitutes or sex workers. Um, sex was thought to generate excess heat in the body yeah why would people stigmatize sex workers during a time of plague i mean promiscuous sex is a uh, an incubator for all sorts of illnesses it seems to me a fairly adaptive response um which if your kind of medical understanding is based on humoral theory would make you more vulnerable to to infection to disease um, and of course, there's also a kind of moral contagion idea there too. So prostitutes were also, um, yeah, marginalized during plague, plague epidemics. And then I think the poor were, were a kind of broad category, which is something I was kind of interested in the piece too, that... Well, I would think that different groups would have different levels of sanitary practices, And generally speaking, all things being equal, I would expect uh, richer groups to be more sanitary in their practices than poorer ones. There is this really interesting tension between the rhetoric against the poor on the part of the government, um, which often, you know, sees the poor as both vulnerable, but also as um, sort of essentially um, irresponsible, not... Well, if you're poor, you have fewer options, right? You're in more desperate straits. So it would be understandable that other people would regard them as less responsible because the poor have less ability to be responsible when their own survival is at stake. Civic minded, um, even their bodies were thought to be more kind of corruptible. So one of the physicians in Florence at the time, Alessandro Righi, has a theory um, that the poor sort of fester plague in their bodies um, in a way that nobles don't. Um, But then on the other hand, they also looked after them and they had this kind of extensive welfare program and food provisioning as we as we spoke about. So there's a kind of really interesting tension there between um, both blaming the poor and and also um, and also looking out for them, which I. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how the world works. People are complicated, right? People can fear a group and have disgust for a group and simultaneously make provision for the group. All right back to what the heck is on going on with Noam Chomsky. Why does his rhetoric sound so Trumpian? Or is this not rhetoric that is 
common among dissidents, whether they're on the left or the right. It's also funny to refer to The Guardian as the so-called left. <laughs> I know that, that is a common referring, especially amongst the leftist side, you know, the, the so-called left-wing Guardian. But like The Guardian's, it's pretty lefty, right? <laughs> <laughs> the real left. That's like the real IRA, right? It's a splinter group. It's true. <laughs> it's, it's all in the eye of the beholder and um, whatnot. I guess it's the corporate left. So let me play another clip which highlights the way he sees this issue. The parliamentary party the Blairite Parliamentary Party, did not want to see... In fact, they said it. We have the documents in the labor files. Said we do not want to lose our party, the party that we own, to this effort to develop a popular-based party working for working people and the poor. We don't want to lose our party to that. No, that's not what they said. That's not what they said. They did not want... That's Jeremy Corbyn said you could read it in the labor they, files. They did not say they did not want a government that wants to act for the poor. What they said was they did not want someone... They said exactly. they didn't want to lose their party. I so, had so a man with well, a track record of tolerating anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and uh, taking anti-West positions, including wanting to give Russia the benefit of the doubt over the Salisbury poisonings was one of the big things that they, they protested. There's no, there's no anti-West position. I, I do appreciate the British pundit style of interviewing yeah, because it's just, it contrasts quite distinctly with Lex Friedman's approach, for example, or the trigonometry <laughs> people, right? Like... Yeah, but uh, Noam Chomsky, I mean, it just, it's so Trumpian, this kind of, this kind of rhetoric, All right? Is a... Uh, Little burst from Dennis Prager on his show last week. It puts transgender and gender non-conforming students in, quote, danger of imminent irreparable harm. Wow. But Talking about school districts in California that mandate the parents be notified if th their children in public schools change genders. Well, wouldn't the parents know anyway? By potentially outing them at home before they're ready, according to the lawsuit. Really, you're in danger of imminent irreparable harm. Maybe you're in danger of imminent irreparable harm when you fall into the hands of so many sick, so-called therapists who say to the eight-year-old, oh, you think you're a boy? You are. The profession of psychology and the profession of psychiatry have been so denuded of excellence and truth as to become a farce. Most psychiatrists and most psychologists are frauds to their profession. Uh, yeah, but, okay, I think that's somewhat of an overstatement. But uh, what about talk show hosts? I mean, couldn't you make all these same arguments about talk show hosts such as Dennis Prager? So I, I largely agree with Dennis Prager's analysis here, but I think he is overstating it. And I think his analysis would equally apply to people such as himself. I've always known this. This is not new. How many psychiatrists announced in 1964, what is that, two generations ago, that Barry Goldwater was mentally ill? The, the profession of psychiatry, for reasons I do not know, since in its core it's, it can be terrific. It's a profession that's highly subjective because there aren't blood tests, right? There aren't concrete tests to determine psychiatric illnesses. So it's a profession that is largely revolves around achieving billing through insurance companies and so making diagnoses that insurance companies will pay for and providing medication that is supplied by pharmaceutical companies right so meeting economic incentives has you know created the psychiatric profession as we know it the profession of psychiatry apparently breeds a particularly narcissistic fool arrogant fools it does not uh, the profession of pundit also do exactly the same thing. How many fools are not arrogant? What percentage of fools are arrogant? Well, I won't go off on that tangent. This is quite a story. And it will persuade virtually no one to stop voting Democrat. Because there is nothing they can do to persuade people. Okay, overheated rhetoric there from Dennis Prager. Let's get back to analysis, analyzing Noam Chomsky. Yeah. Whether or not you agree with Matt Jolie's response, I think it's better that he presents the, you know, like a kind of, no, 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 it's like this, because you can also hear Chomsky respond then to the critique. The UK is famous, isn't it, for its competitive journalists. They don't do these softball interviews. So, so what's the background there? Like, what's the bigger picture in your eyes, Chris? You you know UK politics and um, what oh, Chomsky's all vision that. of it is. Yeah, so he just, he doesn't like Keir Starmer. And Corbyn was a more far left, member of the party who had for quite a long time been a kind of gadfly on the fringes, but then became the leader of the party, which gave a lot of power to groups in Labour that had been marginalized for one reason or another. And then they didn't win two elections. Corbyn is not the leader. The new leader is a kind of 
moderate left wing, what they regard as a neo Blairite type. And mm -hmm. so predictably, Chomsky doesn't like him and thinks it's a coup of sorts to play it's the Right, th this is similar rhetoric, similar thinking to Christian nationalists, right? People on the very opposite side of the political spectrum uh, who also believe that a you know institutional neoliberal elite is trying to thwart the will of the people. Real party of the people that was being built with a defanged conservative party light version thereof. And and the part which is sort of interesting is that there's these endless reports flinging back and forth about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and accusations that it's been oversold or that it's being under-recognized, depending on, on how you look at it. But I think what is pretty much non-debatable, wherever you fall, is that it's been a topic that has been used on both sides, right? It's been used as an opportunistic attack, as well as it's being denied, you know, it's being painted as just a smear. And, and there are actual grievances, there are actual reports, but there are also reports showing that various factions are weaponizing it or accusing it of being weaponized. So the anti-Semitism is real. There were real concerns. I mean, I just, no Chomsky in these clips, he sounds like the, the My Pillow guy. <laughs> he does those ads that are ubiquitous in right-wing media. Turns with reactions directed at Corbyn and Corbyn's wing from the Jewish community. But it, it also was a handy thing to use as a delegitimizing issue. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I yeah, Noam Chomsky in these clips, he sounds like Mike Lindell of my pillow. Yes, the difference between how I might look at these things and how Chomsky would is, without knowing the intricacies of UK politics, is that this is all pretty normal in, in parliamentary democracies like, like Australia and the UK, right? You've got your centre parties, they have their different factions. Our Liberal Party's got a right faction and a left faction, and our Labour Party's got a right faction, a left faction, and other factions too, I'm sure. And when, you know, these different factions, sometimes one has control, sometimes the other has control, if they're not doing particularly well in the polls, if there's some scandals or, you know, difficult things going on, then they get knocked over and the other group gets in and gets to run the show for a while. So it all seems like, like pretty much part of <laughs> Yeah, but the, that's not how Chomsky looks at it, right? It's, it's, now, there's a plot, essentially. There's the mechanisms of neoliberalism coming into play to get rid of the people's choice and what the people want. Yeah, and for example, in the way that he presents Corbyn, it's not just that he's a person with a particular political agenda. It's that he's a very good person with a very important political goal. That right. Thinking of our institutions, it's been almost 22 years since 9-11. There have been no new airline hijackings of which I'm aware. So maybe... Maybe our institutions are doing a pretty good job here, right? Would you have thought on September 12th or for the first year after 9-11 that we'd go another 22 years without uh, a major hijacking? Uh, it would have led to great outcomes if it hadn't been foiled. So, for example... You can read it in Al Jazeera. Is uh, Japan a poor country? No, it's not. The British press has chosen to mostly suppress it and marginalize it. But that's a problem for the British press. Right, the, the British press, they're, they're marginalizing the, the good people around Jeremy Corbyn, just like uh, Trumpists believe that uh, the, the, the American press are you know, trying to marginalize the Make America Great Again movement. Corbyn has since been virtually kicked out of the Labour Party. His effort to try to develop a popular-based party, participatory party, that would serve the interests of working people and the poor was smashed by the British establishment. It's a scandal, okay? But it uh, has nothing to do with these other things that we're talking about. Yeah, so you got that, Matt? <laughs> so he was just trying to solve the issue for the poor and the working class people, and the establishment couldn't have that, so they destroyed him and his efforts, and now he's, he's marginalized. It is not what you said, which is standard political horse jockeying proposition. Uh, well, I guess um, his sympathy for Corbyn is understandable. They share a lot of similar kind of anti-imperialist, anti-war in general kind of views, Corbyn against pretty much every military intervention in recent history, including in Libya and Syria. Yeah, I see here has even called for NATO to be disbanded. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's not a totally mainstream stance, even for a Labour Party leader, right? No, no. Much ink has been spilled on Jeremy Corbyn and, and where he stands, but he is well known for his opposition to the Iraq war and criticism of Israel. Not particularly surprising. These are not unheard of positions on the left and, and particularly not to the more progressive wing of the left, especially the criticisms of Israel. It's interesting how the hard left and hard right positions kind of dovetail there because, you know, like with withdrawing from NATO, its skepticism towards those sort of multilateral agreements is, is something you also see on, on the right in America and, um, and the UK. Slightly different motivations, but I guess it ends up at the same place. Well, yeah, there, there are interesting overlaps. Although, for example, Corbyn was, I think, credibly accused of not campaigning very effectively against Brexit. 
for different reasons than the right wing concerns about immigration. He also had concerns about stronger partnerships with Europe that primarily revolved around opposition to neoliberal globalization. But actually, that somewhat distinguishes him a little bit from Chomsky, because when Chomsky was talking about the EU in the interview, he said this. Um, and there's no sign of any, of any benefit from leaving the EU. What, do you think that was a, a sensible decision by Britain to do that? I thought at the time that it was a very serious error, uh, both harmful to Britain, harmful to Europe, uh, in a way beneficial to the United States, because under Brexit, Britain becomes even more subject to US domination than it was before. Uh, but I thought it was a terrible mistake. And I think the record since basically confirms that. Good. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Correct. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and there is a clip, Matt, of him summing up Keir Starmer for you. I actually don't think he gets much wrong here, but this is him discussing Starmer. Well, so far, there are people like uh, Will Hutton, for example, who think that Keir Starmer has all sorts of fine plans for um, social reform and so on. I don't see any evidence of it. All he's been doing so far is purifying the Labour Party of any militant activist elements and uh, putting it under more central control, eliminating people like Corbyn, of course, Driscoll recently, and others who do um, work for a constituent-based party with uh, dealing with needs of the uh, constituency, labor constituency. So it seems to me we'll, he'll probably move towards a Blairite-style parliamentary, elite parliamentary party. That's your life. Well, Keir Starmer seems a technocrat. He seems pretty effective. He seems to be moving towards the centre. He's got to be an overwhelming favourite to be Britain's next uh, Prime Minister. Uh, regarding leaving the European Union, I was quite supportive of Brexit when it happened, but now I have to admit that uh, overwhelmingly it seems like it's it's a negative thing for Great Britain. Its economy is suffering. There's you know, no good news on the horizon for Great Britain's economy. I'd have to say from what I know now, uh, leaving, leaving, Bra uh, leaving the European Union was a disaster for Great Britain. Oh, yes, it used to be cool. Sounds about right to you, Chris. No, he's got a negative spin on it, but like he, he is correct that, like we discussed, you know, whichever faction is in power tends to want to shore up its support and marginalize the elements <laughs> that might disrupt that, which Corbyn also attempted to do when he was in the leadership position. But he is also right that, in general, dramatic reform efforts, I, I wait to see evidence of that. But again, I think that's, you know, it's pretty common in center left parties that nobody's really happy with what they do. They make too many concessions and too many promises and then everybody's fed up with them. But as long as they get power for a little while, I'll get fed to that because the conservatives have been in power for a long time in the UK. Yeah. Matt. Generally, center parties are pretty much focused on winning elections and adjust their policy to suit. I guess that's something where, like, I'm just trying to identify what, if anything, is wrong <laughs> with Chomsky now view, because, you know, he's a, a lefty with opinions. And a lot of what he's talking about here is just giving his political opinions. And I think almost all political opinions are valid in a way. But I guess my issue... So I remember when COVID broke out, uh, just before COVID broke out, I'd been wearing a face mask because I was doing a lot of cleaning and shredding, and I just didn't want to breathe in the fumes. And so people uh, around me said, oh, you know, you're early with face masks. And face masks did just make a certain amount of common sense to me early on in COVID. And I remember the, the overwhelming elite media consensus about face masks with regard to COVID for about the first month of, for, for March, right, was overwhelmingly that they are useless and people would mock me for wearing a face mask. Right? The, the dominant left-wing media public health consensus was there's no need to wear face masks. It's likely to spread around the entire world. A lot of people are going to get it. Potentially most of the world's population are going to get it, which sounds terrible, but it the, of most of the people who get coronavirus will not die from it. Okay. Um, it's got about a 2% fatality rate. Um, and the way that we all need to deal with it, although it is a, a new threat, we've never seen this virus before, it's actually very old fashioned ways of protecting ourselves. You do all the things that you do to protect yourself from getting a cold or from getting the flu. We don't have to do anything outrageous. We don't need to change our lives drastically at an individual level. You just need to be more vigilant about washing your hands, make sure you don't develop patterns where you don't touch your face. Uh, that's the way that we tend to give ourselves colds in the flu. So at an individual level, there's no reason to panic, but it's a serious thing. I saw somewhere they said, don't sneeze or cough on people. I go, 
<laughs> Were we doing that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Were people doing that? New Year's resolution? <laughs> it's like, I'm gonna uh, I gotta stop coughing this. on people. I really am yeah, get, not getting invited back to parties. But yeah. I've seen a lot of the masks around the city. Is that a. That's what? probably not a, not a thing. Um, no. I mean, you're seeing it, but it's probably not that smart. The Surgeon General actually put out a statement which was like, you guys, stop buying masks. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I saw that. If, if you are sick, if you have respiratory symptoms, that's, people are wearing a mask in that circumstance because you're trying to avoid giving it to other people. Gotcha. But in terms of being a healthy person and trying to avoid getting infected, that's probably not, not that rational. So <laughs> that was the, the dominant left-wing media public health consensus for about a month. And then it ch changed 180 degrees. Uh, I think I've always felt that uh, for respiratory illness, wearing a mask uh, possibly provides some level of protection for yourself. And common sense suggests to me that it would reduce transmission somewhat, so modestly. And I noticed that uh, there are various parts of the United States that are masking up again again, due to a new wave of COVID, and I think that's probably a, a good idea. So I am, in general, pro-mask. You can do it you know, too much. There's no need to, to wear a mask if you're walking around outside. I, I would have videos deleted from YouTube because I would say that if you're just walking around outside, I don't see any benefit to wearing a mask, and YouTube would delete those videos as a violation of their terms of service. But if you are stuck in an enclosed space with, with other people, then in certain circumstances, it would seem to me you know, a, a modestly helpful measure to wear a mask. 40, is it true you lost half your audience because of COVID? Uh, probably something like that. I certainly seem to disagree with 90% of the people in the chat in that I took COVID seriously and I thought that the public health advice was 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 decent to good and that our elites and our major institutions did a better than expected job. I pro wearing mask when you're around other people in enclosed circumstances and you know COVID is rampant. I am okay with the, the shutting of the schools. I don't have a super strong opinion, but if we hadn't shut the schools and everyone would have caught COVID as it is, we had 2000 children under 18 die of COVID and tens of thousands have to be hospitalized because of, of COVID. So I, I don't think uh, shutting the schools for a year until everyone got vaccinated was, was a bad idea. Strongly support vaccination. So in general, pretty much side with the establishment and with most public health with regard to COVID. So there were various parts of public health and politicians who would uh, decry various vaccinations because there was a tiny percentage of people who would get, you know, an enlarged heart, which was just a temporary symptom in almost all cases. So public health, of course, wasn't perfect, and they have to put out a message that will be understandable to people, you know, throughout the IQ spectrum. So they had to dumb it down, and they couldn't, they didn't feel like they could uh, put, out, put out a message that, that was uh, realistic to threats, but they had to often overstate threats and overstate the effectiveness of what they were recommending, such as mass social distancing and uh, vaccines to try to shake people up to get people to do what they regarded as the right thing. But overall, I think the establishment did a better than average job. 40 should wear a mask until the end of time to prove he is pro-social. No, what's pro-social depends on a certain context. If you are in an enclosed area with other people and you have a respiratory illness or there's a respiratory illness going around, in that context, wearing a mask seems to me a good idea. Does a mask help if I'm driving alone in my car? It doesn't help you not get COVID. It doesn't help you not transmit COVID. What it does do is it signals that you're a virtuous person who cares about taking, you know, public health measures to reduce the spread of COVID. It's virtue signaling, but unlike pretty much everyone I know on the right, I regard virtue signaling as a good thing, right? In nature, animals are signaling all the time. We are signaling. I, I wear a yarmulke, right? I am signaling my commitment to Orthodox Judaism. I see virtue signaling as a good thing. 
I washed out my groceries at the start. Then I realized it was a nothing burger for those who are not 70 plus. Well, it wasn't a nothing burger, right? You had 2,000 kids under 18 who died from it, countless people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s died from it. Still, the average age of death was around 70. But according to the most comprehensive academic survey we have, that uh, the average COVID death took 16 years of expected life. So it was, it was a very significant illness. We could all use a bigger heart. Well, the, the heart swelling symptom was almost always temporary. And overall, the, the damage from taking the COVID vaccine paled in comparison to the damage of not taking the COVID vaccine. Yeah, I wear my hamburger in the shower to signal my virtue. But no one would see what I wear in the shower, so there's no virtual signaling going on. I, I don't think I was ever washing my groceries, but I remember many people who did. I, I remember even 18 months into COVID, there were still all these signs about the importance of hand washing to reduce the spread of COVID. And obviously that was bogus. It was a respiratory virus that would spread through the air, not so much uh, through hands. With him is in that misrepresenting points of fact and creating a narrative around a very sort of one-eyed view of things that have happened. I mean, that's probably the point at which I'd, I'd criticize him for, not so much just for being a hard lefty per se. Yeah, yeah. Let's move to him talking about Ukraine. <laughs> Let's see <laughs> if we can spot any similar such issues um, or perhaps good things. So he talked about this quite a bit, and it does come up in two of the interviews that we've covered. This one probably goes a bit long, but in any case, let's hear it. You mentioned the uh, the war in Ukraine. Let, let's turn our attention to that. Um, certainly in, in the UK, the left, uh, actually under people like Jeremy Corbyn, had argued that it wasn't Russia that was the enemy, it was the US that was destabilizing the world. And then Russia invades a sovereign... And uh, Luke Croft in the chat says, I have family members who slept in their masks. Well, if it gave your, your family members a sense of agency that they were doing something, right, that they had able to exert some control over this threat, then the, the psychological payoff from what they did, you know, may well have been worth it, right? We, we do all sorts of things to try to feel like we're more in control of a chaotic world around us. Democratic country right on its, on its border, starting a conflict which has claimed tens of thousands of, of innocent lives. Does that not make clear that who the real threat to the world is? It's not the US, it's the left is, is arguing. Uh, Horatius says people will believe anything the government tells them shows that the power is all that matters not true that's not true people will not believe anything the government tells them all right people did not evolve to be gullible right there are all sorts of things that the government tells people that they don't believe uh, particularly in the United States there's probably more suspicion of the government in the United States than in any other first world country of, of which I'm aware Good for a long time it's, it's Vladimir Putin's Russia well, the invasion of Ukraine is plainly a war crime. You can put it in, can't put it in the same category as greater war crimes, but it's a major one, uh, according to the uh, official. Uh, the only evidence that we have, solid evidence, is United Nations estimates, uh, Pentagon estimates, and so on. They estimate about 8,000 civilians killed. That's a lot of people. What the United States and Britain do overnight, it's uh, presumably it's an underestimate. So let's say it's. And the chat says, people will submit to power, they will kiss the king. They will submit to power when it's in their interest to do so. They will fight the power when it's in their interest to do so. And it all depends on the situation. People revolt when it's in their interest to do so. People bend the knee when it's in their interest to do so. What determines whether people kiss the ring or kiss the king or ignore the king? All right, it depends on the situation. The situation is king. The king is not king. The situation is king. So in certain circumstances, believing the government, acquiescing to power is in your best interest. In other circumstances, disbelieving the government and fighting the power is the best thing to do. Twice that much. That would put it at the level of the U.S.-backed invasion, Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which killed about maybe 20,000 people. I suppose it's off by a factor of 10. That is, the casualty rate is really 10 times as high as is claimed. Well, that would put it in the category of Ronald Reagan's terrorist atrocities in El Salvador, roughly on the order of 80,000. So it's serious. Of course, Iraq is just another dimension. So it's serious. It's a terrible crime. Uh, and the chat says people will not rebel until the power goes off. People are cattle. Well, your primary meaning and purpose in life should come from your family, extended family. There's no reason to rebel. 
And in current circumstances, whether in Great Britain, Australia, Canada, United States, there's no reason to rebel in a way that, that breaks the law and puts your well-being in, in danger. Uh, who would you rebel against and what would you rebel for? Hundreds of thousands of businesses bankrupt and out of business because of lockdowns destroyed countless lives for nothing. No, we know pretty definitively that lockdown saved lives. Now, in, in every case, was a lockdown warranted? Was every method used in lockdowns appropriate? You know, was there plenty of government overreach? Did they lock down the wrong thing? Such as in Southern California, they locked down beaches and public parks and hiking. All right very things that you want people doing, right? You want people getting out there and, and moving around. That's the, the best thing possible during an influenza epidemic. And so, yeah, there were mistakes made. But uh, overall, lockdowns, until we had widespread use of uh, vaccines, were the best thing to do. And social distancing is a very old technique that's been used to deal with with plagues for thousands and thousands of years right why have we used social distancing with with regard to, to plagues for thousands of years because it works right we, we didn't we didn't uh, implement uh, social distancing out of nowhere because there was no precedent for it like social distancing helped in in dealing with the, the black death and uh, social distancing has helped with dealing with uh, COVID as well You can understand why the global South does not take very seriously the uh, eloquent uh, uh, protestations of Western countries about this unique epi uh, episode in history. Uh, they've been victims of far more. Maybe the Russians will go on to our level, maybe. Ah, right. So he agrees it was a war crime to, in to invade Russia. That's, that's positive, right? Anything but... else? <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems a bit equivocal, I suppose, about the question of uh, who's responsible for the conflict. Well, he's often accused of engaging in whataboutism that focuses on America and the West's crimes over and above any other countries. And whether you regard that as whataboutism or an accurate accounting, I think it is fair to say that's quite clearly on display there. You can present that as he's appropriately contextualizing the scale of the conflict and highlighting that the Western nations are not saints in any sense of the word. But it does sound a little bit like downplaying the scale of the conflict. And, you know, basically, if somebody mentions a conflict and you immediately cite other conflicts, it, it is like a way to point the attention elsewhere, right? Yeah. But it can't be denied that he, he did begin by saying it is a war crime, right? Yeah. Just perhaps a lesser war crime than what the US and other countries have done. Um, mm. So a bit more on this. But so, certainly from, from left-wing politics in the UK, this this trying to create equivalence, the, an anti-West position um, become well, you're, you're equivalence you are drawing equivalence you're saying that you've just you've literally just drawn equivalence with with the number of deaths in various places I, explain to people listening to this why what you're not saying is because ronald reagan did this or george bush did that that doesn't make what vladimir putin's done all right does it First point, i said it's a major crime but there's no equivalence that's following the party line i gave figures no equivalence maybe the casualty toll is 10 times as high as is estimated well that would make it like Reagan's crimes in El Salvador. It's not equivalent. Okay, let's look at this uh, Michael Hildzik column in the Los Angeles Times, came out August 29, said the early months of COVID pandemic before vaccines became widely available, lockdowns worked, combined with other non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs. So that's not uh, Richard Spencer's former organization. Uh, masking and social distancing slowed the spread of disease, saved millions of people from falling ill, landing in the hospital and dying. Absent these measures, hospitals, which were already overrun with patients in dire conditions, would have fared worse. Studies from as early as mid-2021 validated these findings. Latest evidence comes from the Royal Society, Britain's 360-year-old Academy of Sciences, known for its painstaking objective research. The report the Society released this month studied the effect of non-pharmaceutical interventions in Hong Kong, New Zealand, and South Korea during the first 18 months of the pandemic. Evidence shows unequivocally that Lockdowns and other social approaches provide powerful, effective, and prolonged reductions in virus transmissions. These steps are most effective if undertaken when disease transmission is low. So the idea that it was virtuous to reopen schools in the heat of the pandemic is based on a bunch of myths beloved by conservative politicians. There's a myth that school closings and the shift to remote teaching was almost entirely responsible for the test decline in test scores. The evidence for that is murky. 
about 360,000 American children lost a primary, a secondary caregiver to COVID. Nearly 300,000 American children were orphaned by the loss of one or two parents. What brought COVID into most households in a shocking number of cases? It was children. More than 70% of households began with a child bringing the virus into the home. And the transmission rate fell during school breaks. That underscores the role of kindergarten through 12 classrooms in spreading the coronavirus. So children were important viral vectors in households during the pandemic. You, you can't have an effective social distancing if you allow schools to remain open. There's another myth perpetuated by many people on the right that children were largely immune to COVID and that if they contracted COVID, their symptoms were mild or non-existent. You know that more than 2,300 children have died from COVID. What would have happened if schools remained open without any mitigation measures? Nearly all children would have gotten COVID as would everyone they live with and almost all school employees. So this is uh, Dr. Jonathan Howard writing here, was closing schools an obvious and colossal mistake? Maybe it was a mistake to close schools. However, those who make this claim should honestly grapple with what would have happened had nothing been done rather than indulge in an absurd fantasy that everything would have been fine. So what would have happened if all schools had stayed open? All children would have gotten COVID, as would virtually everyone they live with and almost all school employees. Right? The virus spread rapidly in schools. So how would the unmitigated spread of COVID affected children, none of whom were vaccinated? Right? In the US, over 2,300 kids have died from COVID. Right? This number would have been far higher had 60 to 70 million unvaccinated children contracted the virus over several months time in 2020. Right? Thousands more children would have died without these mitigation methods. Death is not the only bad outcome from COVID. In the real world, around 150,000 children were hospitalized with COVID. Some needed mechanical ventilation in the ICU. Many suffered neurological complications. Sometimes they needed amputations. Sometimes they had strokes. All right, now, the vaccine has drastically lowered the risk of these rare but grave outcomes but many more thousands of children would have been hospitalized and developed severe complications if the schools had remained open. Uh, many pediatric hospitals were already deluged during the Delta and Omicron waves. They would not have had the resources to treat sick children had tens of millions of sick children contracted COVID in a short time, particularly considering many healthcare workers were sick with COVID at the start of the pandemic. Many healthcare workers would have contracted COVID either from their jobs or from their own children had no mitigation methods been taken. So over 300,000 American children became orphaned by COVID. In New York City, one in 200 children lost a parent in the first two years. Not all children experience COVID as something light, not all bounce back immediately. Many children felt too sick to attend school. During the Omicron wave, 30% of New York City students were absent. So if schools had reopened without mitigation measures, many children would have missed school anyway for these reasons. Teachers would have been at risk. So from May 11, 2020, article in New York, New York City Department of Education has now lost 74 employees to COVID. 30 were teachers. Even after vaccines became available, 15 Miami-Dade educators died from COVID in 10 days. So more educators would have died, none of whom would have been vaccinated in the pandemic's first nine months if no mitigation measures had been taken. So would teachers really have been willing to work in schools with no mitigation methods? In the real world, sick teachers couldn't teach anyway. So many principals were begging parents to act as substitute teachers. Had a headline from Texas, September 2021, at least 45 districts shut down in-person classes due to COVID-19 cases affecting more than 40,000 students. One school in New York City sent a notice that though it was open, the kids were just going to hang out in the auditorium. There weren't enough teachers, so the school was nothing more than a daycare center. So many educators would have been out sick had no mitigation measures been taken. Who would have taught the students? But... 
I suppose some people listening to this will think you're seeking to excuse what no legislative truth has done. That is fabrication of the right wing. I am not seeking to excuse anything. I said it's a terrible war crime. That's not excusing anything. I'm talking about the extreme hypocrisy of claims about well, how this is the worst thing that ever happened when it's a fraction of what we do all the time. Hmm. What about that, Matt? Well, it does remind me of some of the less salubrious type of Twitter discourse where um, you might find people comparing death counts in various The gulags conflicts. versus the concentration camps, for example. Yeah, yeah. So it seems a bit tangential to me, frankly, like precisely how many people died here compared to there. Because, I don't know. <laughs> There's other factors at play. But yeah, so one thing I think which is worth noting is Chomsky remains pretty clear there, right? First of all, he's saying there's not an equivalence. The West is, has a much higher death toll. So he's saying there isn't an equivalence because it's, it's way smaller in the, the case of yeah. the Ukraine conflict. And second, he is clear, though, that he didn't justify it, right? Like he, he says, no, I've been clear that I said it's a war crime, a lesser war crime, perhaps. But he, he is quite clear, right, that he's, he's not saying it's okay. He's just mm. wanting so to say... Not the as bad. Is worse. The West <laughs> yeah. is worse. Yes, you're right. That's a good summary. I think that's a fair appraisal of what he's what he said. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Matt Jolly, the interviewer there, is highlighting that that response can be seen as minimizing what's occurring. And I, I don't know, Matt, but there is something about like has the U.S. in recent decades threatened to nuke a country after annexing a portion of it? Because mm. that does seem to be like there are differences. You can have legitimate critiques of a whole bunch of the stuff that Western nations have done around the world. And there are plenty of well-documented colonial events and holdovers. But Vladimir Putin's rhetoric about the willingness to use nuclear weapons, the dire threats that will be coming to anyone who dares mm. stand in their rightful reclamation of their territory, mm -hmm. it does seem different. Look, I'm always very wary about comparing the magnitude of bad things in just in terms of these raw numbers, because it's it's terribly flattening to do that. So you could compare Ukraine to, say, the Korean War. You go, well, you know, the Korean War had this many hundred thousand casualties. So the US is a bigger criminal than, than Russia. But that just totally ignores the context and the causes and who was instrumental in invading whom and a whole bunch of things. So look, there's no doubt. So Decoding the Gurus did an episode on Ibram X Kendi. So inside of you, two, there are two walls. One of them is uh, racist. <laughs> there can be instances let me find where the measures that are targeted, for instance, that it, okay, let me find saying, the... is Kendi is, you know, policy. It could well be the Australian federal policy has, this is what a lot of people in regional Queensland think, that it, that it disregards people living out here and doesn't value them and so on. They, they're quite resentful. About the fact. It, it could well be the policy feeds into it as well. But uh, I, don't, I think primarily, actually, it's more history. And so maybe I was too quick to respond because like, I agree. That's, that's kind of what I mean, like historical factors, but not necessarily the historical discriminatory factors between groups. It can be a whole bunch of things that might exacerbate that some groups are favored over others, but that they can be just geographical things or so on. But also cultural, Chris, I mean, one of the things that is really apparent in the area that I live is that the, the local people here who, again, I emphasize are, are white Australians, they, they just they usually multi, like, you know, like more than 50% of Australians are first or generation immigrants. But people that I'm thinking of are like third generation or so. And one of the things you notice about the culture is that they don't value education and they often get married very young. You know, it's, it's kind of like the stereotypes of the American deep South, I suppose, uh, on the, how true they are. But, you know, like culture, culture does feed into it and it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with, with the people. And there, there can be historical reasons for the culture, exactly, right? Yeah. But again, you're chicken and egging, and not you. I mean, in general, the interrelationship of culture and historical circumstances is interact. Yeah, exactly. It's a yin-yang type scenario. Yes, and there's a point where, actually, I think it's an Ezra Klein interview where Ezra brings that up. I think one question somebody would have is, why can't it be both and? Like, why can't there be some differences in cultures or geographies that people come from or whatever it might be, and also that there is racist policy? What makes you certain that it is all one as opposed to some of one and some of the other? Well, I actually do think there's, there's racialized difference. And so, obviously, geneticists have found that uh, there's a such thing as ethnic ancestry. And, of course, each ethnic group has been racialized, of course, to a large extent. those. Okay, that was Ibram Candy speaking. Horatio says, mail-in voting caused by COVID lockdowns. It's given an advantage to Democrats who will never be overcome by the Republicans. Unless a big shift happens, GOP is completely done for. There's absolutely no reason the Republicans cannot be as effective in mail-in voting as Democrats. The Trump campaign got a record turnout, right? They did a really good job at turning out their voters, just the Democrats did better. But there's no inherent reason going forward that uh, Democrats would do better at securing mail-in voters than Republicans. Ethnic groups practice different cultures, but at the same time, there's no biological difference you know, via race. There's no behavioral difference. In other words, across cultures, people love, people lazy. I believe there are five states in, in America that already have uh, mail-in voting. 
they don't have in-person voting. So there's nothing inherently anti-Republican about it. People hate, people laugh, they just do it in different ways. But ultimately, I think more specifically to your, to your point, just because there's difference, cultural and even ethnic, doesn't mean it's better or worse, or doesn't mean it's explaining away racial inequity. Because fundamentally, hey, Ricardo, we never have received bro, that evidence. Long time, no talk. How's it going? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. I've been meaning to call in for a couple of weeks. You did a show a couple of weeks ago. 